This podcast channel is about you, successful international entrepreneurs, successful expats, successful investors, sponsored by ECJ Contact. In good evening to you all. And for those joining us from other time zones, for example, the US, good morning or good day, depending on where you are. So welcome to our weekly live streams. So every week, we at an HTG.tax, we do a live stream on an a international tax topic of interest. And this week, we have the honor and the privilege of welcoming, again, Ariel Katz, who is going to talk about Israel tax and Israel related tax issues. I know some of you sent your questions in advance. Thank you for doing that. Those who have not yet done so, feel free to type in the box below and we'll get to them in the order in which they are received. And for those who may be new, and I see some people joining us who have been here before, but for those who are new, please note that nothing we say here should be construed as advice. We're talking about general tax principles in very broad terms. If you want advice that is specific to your unique circumstances, then you need to engage a, a tax professional like uh, Ariel or myself, who can walk you through the process and dispense with advice that is relevant to your situation. So right now we're having a general conversation, general principles, you can treat it as educational or you can treat it as entertainment, but it is not advice. Just want to make sure that we get that. So without further ado, I hand you over to Ariel. Oh, wait, please do know that this is being recorded. If you do not want your image to show up in the recording, please feel free to keep your camera switched off. Okay, Ariel, over to you. Thank you. Uh, so this is, we'll just wait like a two or three minutes. I see people are still joining. And, uh, you know, Israelis are not sweet people. So maybe two, three minutes will help uh, other people because I assume uh, six to 10 more clients of mine should join. We'll wait these two minutes and then we can, we can start. Um, meanwhile, can you see my uh, presentation? Yeah. So we'll wait just uh, another one minute and, and we'll stop. Okay, so hello again, everybody. And first of all, thank you, Darren, uh, so much for organizing this webinar. And once again, it's always a pleasure to do this uh, with you. Uh, I will start the first uh, uh, items from my side, and then Darren can complete from his side. And uh, first of all, I want to introduce myself and uh, my office to uh, people that uh, are not already my clients and some of 
uh, of the participants or not. So my name is Ariel Katz, I'm a, an accountant and also a tax lawyer here in Israel. Uh, I'm part of Amos Katz & Co uh, accounting office uh, and we have offices both in Jerusalem and in Tel Aviv. Our office was established in 1987 and uh, we ranked among the 40 uh, biggest firms in Israel, which make us too, uh, not too small and not too big, meaning that we can be like a one-stop shop for everything related to tax, accounting, uh, audit in Israel, uh, in one hand. On the other hand, we're not too big, meaning that our clients are not getting lost here and uh, can always approach uh, one of the partners and get uh, answered directly from one of the partners. A bit about myself. So I said, I'm a content and text lawyer. I'm teaching in the Uber University uh, for the ninth year and also in the IDC, in Herzliya. I uh, have gold medal uh, from the ICPAS and uh, I appear in the press quite regularly uh, uh, with interesting topics. So let's jump directly to the point that I think it's always good to, to discuss and to, to talk about when we are talking about Israeli and US uh, taxation. The first item that may be relevant for some of our participants is the benefits related for first-time Israeli tax resident and returning uh, resident and specifically veteran returning resident. Um, if you are a first-time Israeli resident or someone that's been outside of Israel for a non was not an Israeli tax resident for at least 10 years, you are entitled for 10 years of exemption from both tax and reporting on your non-Israeli sourced income. Uh, here it's very important to emphasize that this exemption, and, and again it's also from tax and reporting, only applies if the income uh, is uh, income that was not generated from here. And uh, to make it clear, if you receiving in Israel a salary from a non-Israeli company, for example, you made Ali, you came to Israel, but you work for a US company and you receive a salary, this salary is regarded as a salary that was generated from Israel, meaning that you need to pay tax on. However, if you will receive a dividend from this US company, this uh, dividend will be tax exempt because dividend from non-Israeli company is regarded as an income that was generated from outside Israel. So it's always uh, uh, smart to check and consult on how to receive the income from your uh, how to receive the income for the foreign pair um, because receiving it doing from a salary or issuing an invoice for Israel for a US company will result in paying tax and reporting in Israel. If you're not sure that you want to stay here in Israel, you came to Israel, but you say, hey, maybe I want to go back, I'm not sure I, I'm saying you for good, you can always uh, uh, request an accommodation here, meaning a year that uh, you can uh, regret and go back to the US without triggering these 10 years of uh, exemption. Uh, many of my clients are not starting right now uh, their 10 years of exemption, but rather are quite at the end of the 10 years of exemption. And this is another point that is uh, uh, very important to get a, a good consultation and to understand how to organize things before the end of the 10 years period. Because uh, uh, if you are acting uh, before the limit of the 10 years, you can receive dividends, you can change the structure of your companies and your business, you can make some transaction fully exempt uh, uh, to sell assets from South Israel to sell, to sell, sell uh, shares of companies without any taxation. But just a minute after the end of the 10 years, uh, you are partly or fully taxed in Israel. And another question that's always arising from when this clock of the 10 years is starting to, to click. And it's also something that we, we check. And from time to time, we uh, also write uh, text and legal opinions on this point. 
So the uh, other US and Israeli succession issues is the uh, situation that an Israeli person is also is a tax resident of Israel, but if you hold a US passport, uh, if you are a citizen uh, uh, of the United States, you are also regarded as a US tax per person for US tax purposes. This means that both of the countries uh, want to put uh, their hands on your income and to tax it. And in one hand, with respect to income tax, we have a quite good mechanism of uh, anti-double taxation. We have the mechanism of the tax credit. On the other hand, we have a problem with respect to the Tuach Lumi in Israel and national security in the US. Meaning that if you're working in Israel as a self-employed, you will pay both Bitoch Lumi in Israel and national security in the US. Of course, we have some solutions for the, this problem. One of them is to work via an Israeli company uh, and to receive the money from your company as an employee. Uh, this is one of the solutions. Other, so, other solutions for small uh, self-employed is to work in, in what we call in Israel, it's not like a straightforward solution, but it can help you not to pay twice both between Lumi and national security. Um, I'm moving forward. Um, one problem that we have with respect to tax credit and taxation from both the countries is with respect to employees option taxation. Um, the problem with respect to employees that receive option from their employer and now want to exercise these options or to sell it, is that uh, Israel and the US work not the same way with respect to how to tax uh, an option. In the US, uh, uh, the uh, IRS is looking on the vesting period, I mean, the time uh, in which the option got vested. However, the current, uh, the way the ITA, the Israeli Tax Authority, is looking at it, is they looking at the time when you exercise the option or sell it. Meaning that, let's talk uh, about an example in which uh, an employee working in the US for four years got all of this option vested in the US, came to Israel at the end of the four years, and day after that, he sell, is exercising or selling the option. US, the IRS will want to tax him because the vesting period was inside the US. On the other hand, Israel will want to tax him because the uh, uh, exercise uh, uh, was done while being in Israel. And uh, therefore, uh, if you are a, a, an employee that receives option and you are uh, doing some kind of relocation, it's always far to consult before you are changing and moving from Israel to US or the other way around from the US to Israel, because otherwise uh, you can get yourself into a tax accident uh, 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 between these two countries. Uh, if people here are not aware of, the Israel, Israel is test uh, regarding who is considered as an Israeli tax resident is quite complex. Currently, we're talking about the center of life test, meaning that we want to, to check and to understand where is your center of life? Where is your wife or husband? Where are your child, uh, children? Um, where do you go to work? Um, if you are a religious person, uh, uh, to which synagogue or, or church are you going? Etc. Etc. Uh, beside this test, there are uh, some days checking tests, meaning that if you've been in Israel more than half of the year, uh, or if you've been in Israel on an average more than 142 days in three years each year, that can make you an Israeli tax resident. Uh, currently, just, just last week, the IPA published some ideas that they want to make the test more simple and more clear. We need to make it a, 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 like a true or false test, but currently the test is quite complex and this is a very non-clear issue whether a person is or is not a tax resident. Of course, sometimes it's clear I've been in Israel, 
I didn't visit outside of Israel since the beginning of the corona, so it's pretty clear that I'm an Israel tax resident, but for people that are traveling and moving in Israel and are outside of Israel and have like a, a life boat here in another country, it can be quite complex. Um, I want to, to talk now uh, about the uh, issue of investing in foreign companies. And I want to jump uh, uh, directly to the problem and maybe the solution of investing in, uh, in LNC uh, companies by Israel. Uh, as I assume most of you know, uh, most of the LLC companies in the US are regarded as a transparent company, meaning that the income go right through the company into the shareholder shareholders and is taxed uh, uh, by the hands of them. However, in Israel, generally, a non-Israeli company cannot be regarded as transparent. Uh, but uh, around 15 years ago, uh, the IDA published a circular saying that with respect to LLCs, we will look at the LLC as transparent if the shareholder will also uh, uh, ask that in Israel. The problem is that uh, they agreed to look at the LLC as transparent, but not fully transparent, meaning that the IPA approach, at least until recently, was that for example, you cannot offset the income of one LLC from the loss of another LLC. Meaning that if you have two LLCs, you are an Israeli tax resident and you're holding two LLCs in the US. One is making income, the other one is having losses. One is a profit, the other one is having losses. In the US, you are offsetting that and you don't pay any tax. In Israel, uh, you cannot, according to the ITA, um, position, you cannot uh, offset this income and loss ending with you paying tax in Israel, ending with you paying actually double tax because next year, if the US companies will make profit, you will find yourself eventually paying both in Israel and the US. Here we had just this week, a quite a major development when the ITA published a, a, their a, a thought about many, many issues, but also regarding these issues. And they quite admit that their position is not quite logic and they want to change it. Uh, in the circular that they published, they actually told that they want to change it from now moving forward. But in my office position, uh, in, in, in the way we see it, uh, we can also take this position and actually we already took it with respect to some of our clients that you can offset in Israel uh, the income from one LLC and the losses of the other. Before it was a bit aggressive, not too aggressive, but a bit aggressive approach. But now after the ITA published their own circular saying that this is the right way to do it, uh, it we feel uh, more comfortable with this tax planning. Um, another issue that uh, Israeli tax resident that invest in the US should always talk about and, and think about, and also every US tax person uh, should think about is the inherent tax, meaning uh, uh, the estate tax uh, uh, and how to deal with it. Uh, um, if you are a US tax person, uh, you had a, a quite high a, a limitation of amount that you're not paying estate tax on. But if you are not a US tax person and you are foreign, meaning just an Israeli, if you had a, above quite small amount, that if I recall correctly, it's around 60,000 uh, US dollars in the US or in US stocks or everything like that, if the person dies, uh, you should pay quite high uh, in rent and tax. Uh, there, were, there are quite there are three ways uh, to solve this problem. One of them is to, to work, to, to, to invest via an Israeli company. The other way is to work via a trust, usually a US uh, trust uh, mechanism. And the third, uh, third solution for that is to actually buy a life insurance, a life insurance that will cover your future potential 
uh, text once the person uh, uh, died. Another uh, issue, quite separate issue when we're talking about Israeli and US taxation is the management and control a, a test from Israel. If you open a US company, Israeli people, I have almost all of the time, a Israeli clients uh, uh, telling me that they want to work with Stripe, uh, they want to open a shop or any other business uh, to sell in the US, they go into Stripe, they open a, a, a shop or something like that. They also can pay quite low amount and to open a Delaware company just from here, from Israel, a, 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 right the day after. It's very, very simple. And these people think that, well, it was so easy. Uh, why are you not working with a US company? Uh, everything is so easy, everything is so nice. Um, in, in, in these circumstances, you have to understand that an Israeli a person is holding a US company, if this company is management, the management and control of this company is from Israel, meaning that the shareholders are from Israel, the managers are from Israel, the employees, if our employees are from Israel, this company will be regarded in Israel as an Israeli company. And therefore, it's usually not too uh, 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 smart to work in this to these kind of companies. And if you do need this kind of US company and everything is done from Israel, it is always smart to also have a US, uh, an Israeli entity and to make uh, some kind of mechanism between these two companies uh, and to work on this transfer pricing, uh, sometimes transfer pricing study, or just uh, at least at the beginning transfer pricing agreement between these two companies in order not to uh, 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 to, to be uh, aligned uh, and not have a problem both with the IRS and with the IDA. Um, another problem that US person, US tax uh, person that are Israeli uh, uh, can suffer from is the taxation, taxation of exempt Israeli income. And there are some exempt Israeli income I mean, that Israeli are fully exempt or some kind of benefits in Israel that I will give examples of in a few minutes that are not exempt in the US. For example, a, a, an Israeli can sell a, a, an apartment in Israel and if it's its sole apartment, it usually will be exempt for betterment tax. In Israel, we call it a matshevach. But in the US, it's many times will not be exempt, and then you will find yourself paying there the tax. Uh, other stuff are, for example, Karen Ishtalmut uh, and other funds that people in Israel are regularly investing uh, in these tax exempt funds. And for US tax uh, person, it can make a, a quite a headache of. Uh, reporting and sometimes paying tax on this, um, uh, uh, these funds. Uh, and in these issues, it is always also smart to consult with your US taxation consulting uh, and to, to understand how uh, this uh, uh, transaction will be reported and how much tax will you pay in the US, uh, even though that in Israel it's fully exempt. Uh, this is everything uh, I want to, to talk about today. I will pass uh, to Darren to, to, to move forward and at the end we'll have time to questions. And uh, once again, thank you everybody for joining us today. And then uh, Darren, you can uh, continue. Thank you very much, Professor. Sorry, I, I, I realized at the beginning I didn't address you by your proper title, Professor Ariel Katz. So thank you for that comprehensive overview. And I see we have some questions still coming in. To those who just joined, please feel free to type your questions in the box below. We get to them in the order in which they are received. Now, typically, I would go through a deck on the U.S. tax side, but I think it's probably more efficient if we just jump into the Q&A because these are issues that you guys specifically want addressed. So without further ado, I go to question number one, 
in the order in which they were received. Thank you for sending them. So question number one, how, how are gains or profits from crypto treated in the U.S. versus uh, Israel? So I'll comment on the U.S. side. And in the U.S., we have two like uh, sets of rulings. Or, well, actually, the first one is like a notice. This is a 2014 notice. Actually, I think there were two in 2014. There's 2014-21 and 2014-16, I think. And then the most update one, updated one we have is 2019-24, which is a revenue ruling. So essentially... Uh, Crypto is treated like any other asset uh, for all intents and purposes. So if you're going to sell it at a price higher than what you paid for it, that gain is subject to capital gains taxes. So I'm not speaking about crypto traders. We have some clients that are algo traders. We're not talking about that. Algo trading or trading is a completely different conversation, just investors, right? So if it is you are an investor, then from a U.S. tax point of view, you're subject to capital gains. Now, in terms of what constitutes a taxable event, we're looking at obviously crypto to fiat, obviously, right? But what is less well known is uh, one crypto to another. So crypto to crypto can be a taxable event. Spending crypto to purchase goods or services can be a taxable event. And earning crypto as income Obviously, that, that, that is definitely taxable. In terms of the, the valuation methodology, historically, people were very much erring on the side of caution. So everyone was advocating FIFO, first in, first out. But right now, the, the Internal Revenue Service, they would accept FIFO, HIFO, or LIFO. So that's in first in, first out, highest in, first out, or last in, first out. So you, you have some choices in how you, you would value from a U.S. side. Uh, professor. So, thank you. In Israel, almost everybody that you do told are quite the same in Israel. Uh, but in Israel, you cannot decide if go between uh, FIFO and LIFO. You must go FIFO. And for uh, crypto investors, usually because the crypto went uh, so high, most of the crypto investors want, want to, to, to uh, check the take the LIFO option, but in Israel it's not an option, you must go FIFO. Mm -hmm. All the other stuff you told are quite the same in Israel. If you're an investor, it will be capital gains. Every change of one crypto, another is a tax event. If you're receiving crypto for your business income, then it's a business income, it's not a capital gain. But if you add after that sell it, it will, the difference would be a capital gains. Everything else is quite the same. Okay, that's wonderful. Thank you for that. The next question, and I guess it's following on from that, are there any tax planning opportunities available in jurisdictions? So in the US, especially now that we're coming to the end of the, the tax slash calendar year, uh, loss harvesting is something that some people engage in. So you can offset capital gains to the extent of capital, uh, you can offset capital losses to the extent of any gains that you may have. So some people take that opportunity to, if you, one coin may have gone up and another coin may have gone down in value, you can uh, recognize that loss. And you can actually, uh, to maintain that position, you can buy it back uh, in early in the new year. So if it came to, if it, in the context of securities like stocks and, and shares, you couldn't do that because of the wash sale rules. But as at this point in time, the wassail rules do not apply to crypto and people take advantage of that. So that, that's, a, that's a common strategy that some people use. Now, in terms of uh, longer term strategies to deal or to mitigate the taxes, we have, it's, it's very nuanced. So it's, I, I won't say this is a one size fits all from a US perspective, but opportunity funds. So uh, under President Trump, we saw the creation of what we call uh, what have been called opportunity zones, and the opportunity funds set up to invest in opportunity zones, you know, qualified opportunity zone funds. And you get if you hold it for. I'm being very simplistic now. If you hold it for like five years, you can mitigate some of the capital gains. Uh, at this point, I think like ten percent. But if you were to keep it in the fund for ten years, you can potentially mitigate all of the capital gains. So. 
there's a locked up period. It is very nuanced. It is very convoluted, but it is something you may wish to consider from a US perspective, Professor. In Israel, you don't have too much end of year that explain with respect to crypto. The only thing that you can do, uh, and I assume most of the crypto investors are not in this position, if you had losses uh, that are not yet realized, you can always just uh, uh, sell and buy a minute after the crypto, uh, and then you can uh, use this loss for other capital gains and offset it one against another. Mm -hmm. But this is basically everything you can do. Okay, understood. Moving on to the next question. Okay, how are foreign companies treated for US tax purposes? Well, in, in the presentation that was touched upon, but essentially from a US tax perspective, if you are a US, if you are US tax exposed, you are required to disclose your investment in foreign companies. If it exceeds, if it's 10% or more, that's a certain level of disclosure. If it's 50% or more, and it may be uh, treated as what we call a CFC or control foreign corp, additional disclosure is, is required. If you invest into a foreign company, it may trigger a form 926. You need to disclose the, the investment into that foreign company. If you uh, have an interest in a foreign partnership, that also needs to be disclosed. If your interest is less than 10%, it's possible it may not need to be disclosed, but it depends on your overall financial position because it may have to be disclosed in something called a form 8938. So it, it really depends. But essentially, it's about disclosure. Uh, the IRS wants to know what you're doing outside of the US. So with international tax from a US perspective, the emphasis is less on revenue collection and more on data. Data is really important to the, to the service. Uh, okay, so that's, that's that question. I hope that helps, I hope that answers you. Another question, again, on foreign companies, someone is asking about anti-deferral rules. So this is quite convoluted uh, and it's quite detailed, sorry. So I'm just touching it lightly. So if it is, the, especially if you're controlled foreign corp, so you're U.S. exposed and you have a company in Israel or anywhere outside of the U.S., of course, it needs to be declared. Now, under certain circumstances, some anti-deferral rules may kick in, which mean that typically the, the default position is that you don't pay U.S. taxes until that company makes a distribution to you, either in the form of a salary or bonus consulting fee or dividends. But there are certain circumstances where you are deemed to have received the distribution even though you did not. And those are triggered by certain anti-deferral rules. Uh, the oldest of which, uh, I think it started back in the 1950s or 60s, subpart F. So that has to do, I mean, generally speaking, just painting very broadly, if you have a company incorporated in one jurisdiction, but you're doing business in another foreign jurisdiction, that may, you need to speak to your tax professional. It may trigger that subpart F. There are also PFIC rules and those passive foreign investment company rules, they came in and, uh, in the 1980s under President Reagan. And those apply if you have more or less, less sort of a, a fund structure. So you've established a company outside of the US and that company generates primarily passive income, so unearned income. So it may dividends, uh, so it may be a holding company, for example, an investment holding company, then you may need to take some advice around the PFIC rules as they can be pretty punitive. And then more recently in 2017, you have President Trump's Tax Cut and Jobs Act, which created the third category of anti-deferral rules, which we call guilty. It normally won't apply in the context of an Israeli company, it mainly applies to lower tax jurisdictions. So low tax jurisdictions like your Caribbean islands, like Singapore, where I'm based or Hong Kong, uh, basically lower tax jurisdictions that, that may be triggered. So again, they, the principle is the same. You, it, these rules are crafted in such a way that you're deemed to be getting money from them, even though you didn't actually constructively receive any money from them. So. 
uh, it's a good question, but it's very, very involved. And you may want to, you can reach out to, to me directly or to your chosen US tax professional to discuss that further. Uh, next question. Uh, again, sticking with this company theme. And yes, for those, you can continue to type questions below and we'll get to them in the order in which they receive. So can nominees be used to avoid US tax declarations? Of course, the IRS has figured this out already. The way the rules are written, when I spoke about the 10% threshold and the 50% threshold, it's written in such a way that it contemplates that some people will try to use nominees. So it speaks about value or voice. So even if you use a debt structure, maybe you just let, uh, it's a loan, or even if it's not equity or use a nominee, once you have influence in that company that exceeds 10% or 50%, depending on the threshold, those rules would apply. So mm, not exactly. Uh, if someone, again, foreign company, I, okay, so a US person is married to someone who is not a US person. If I transfer, if, if my non-US spouse is holding shares, do the rules apply? Okay, so they're asking about attribution rules. I'm just cutting to the chase. I, I, get the, I get the gist of what you're asking. So and because some people, again, the IRS knows that people try to avoid certain thresholds by distributing shares to family members. So to get around that, or to neutralize that little strategy, attribution rules were created. And those attribution rules were tightened under President Trump in 2017 as well. So previously, to some extent, yeah, if you had a non if you had a non-American spouse and that a non-American spouse held some of the shares in the company in which you also hold shares, then you, your shareholding won't be added together. But as of right now, unfortunately, it will. So Whatever, if you hold 9% and your non-American spouse has 91%, then you constructively may be treated as owning 100% of that company, even though your spouse who holds 91% is not a US person. So the attribution rules do apply under certain circumstances with non-American spouses. You may want to, again, speak to your preferred advisor to take a, a deeper dive into that because of course there, there are a lot of implications to restructuring your holding and, and, and whatever. Thank you for that, hope that helps. Next question. Okay, uh, as a self-employed individual and uh, I believe the professor did answer this. So, but you know, it's, it's good that you asked it just, just you know, because you need clarification. So as a self-employed individual living in Israel, I want to know what is the best way to organize my business and work so that I can limit the self-employment tax that I need to pay to the U.S. in addition to what I'm paying in Israel. Professor? Yes. Yeah. I think I, I, I talk about it a bit in the presentation, but um, if you're self-employed, then you will pay income tax only here or maybe add something to the US, but this will not be a tax, uh, double taxation because you will receive tax credit, but you will pay both Bitoof Lumi in Israel and national security in the US, which is quite a uh, double taxation. So the solutions are, if you're making enough money to justify it, working via an Israeli company, so this can be a solution for you. If you're making quite a low amount, if you imagine that you're making a, a law, sometimes what you can do is to receive the income into another company, the company that you're not an owner of, and then receive it outside from that uh, in a salary slip. In Israel, for example, um, uh, uh, there are uh, companies that are called uh, invoices for uh, employees. In Hebrew, the ITA and Bituach Lumi not really like these companies, but if you are paying your Israel Tuchlumi right and your Israeli income tax right, they will not have a, a too much problems with you. Uh, if I'm co uh, connecting what is just asked with the previous question, if, uh, if you have a, a spouse that is not a US tax person, 
sometimes you can open the business on this uh, spouse and have the spouse paying the salary for you. Uh, uh, this is also a solution if only one of the uh, couple is the US uh, person. Okay, that, that's, that's great. Thanks for uh, emphasizing that, that, that point. And unfortunately, there is no totalization agreement uh, between the US and Israel like there is between the US and certain other countries. So it does make it unnecessarily complicated. So yeah, we get that. Uh, I'm looking at the last question and that particular list of questions that we got. What is the most effective way to save money outside of an IRA? If I'm able to max out my IRA every year, how else can I invest in an effective way? Self-employed, 401k. Okay. Uh, thanks for your question. But uh, that is from, you know, it, it's a kind of tricky one to answer in the sense that everyone's situation is different. So you'd probably need to sit with a financial planner who understands your situation inside out and understands specifically what your, what your goals are. You know, are you saving for just for retirement? Is it, what about your kid's education? Are you looking at a college fund as well? Do you have any medical situations that you need to plan for as well? And basically your unique objectives will drive the, the construction of your portfolio and would help you balance a portfolio that would, would meet your objectives. So I, I don't think, uh, unfortunately, I'm sorry, I, I don't think this is a, a forum for this kind of financial planning, but it's a good question. And I think you, you should really meet with a, uh, a qualified financial professional to, to help you navigate through this, especially now that in these uncertain times where things are very dynamic. Okay, so I am um, moving to these other questions that I got. And yes, for those on Facebook, I am seeing your questions, continue to answer those questions. I'm just going through the questions on Zoom first before I switch over to, to Facebook. Thanks, thanks for your patience. Okay, so I have an inheritance from the US. Some of it I will leave there and some of it I will bring here, I guess, to Israel. I file US taxes. What do I do about my Israeli taxes, Professor? Okay, so we first need to understand what is your status. I mean, if you're entitled to the 10 years of benefits, if you're an Ole Hadash, if you're overdone, in retailing resident, you're probably exempt for 10 years. But if you're just an Israeli tax resident, you have to report and pay taxes since the date you receive the interest here. And to start from this year to pay and to report, and not doing so can be a criminal offense. So uh, it's a must to go and to pay tax in Israel. Of course, you first will pay the taxes in the US. And then you will uh, add if anything will need to be added. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, another question. I think it's from the same person. I have a pension from the Board of Ed, Board of Education in Israel, and I get the minimum Social Security from the US. Is there a problem? From a US perspective, I, I see no problem with what you've described, Professor. For me, it's not also not a problem. I assume the, the, the question is, uh, I assume there is going kind of a limit of the minimum social security. Maybe, I don't know if, if it triggered the, the pension from Israel, but from Israel, there is also no, no problem here. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you for that. Okay. So from another person, I recently moved back to Israel after five years in the U.S., as for now, I am not sure if I will stay here or move back there given that situation. What would, would you recommend me to keep my US bank account active as long as I file my taxes annually on both sides? So uh, I'll just make a comment from a US perspective. Well, again, we, you know, I, I don't know about your, your situation, but assuming that you are a US person, as in you have uh, a U.S. passport or uh, you have a green card, so you meet the green card test as, as per Section 7701 of, of the tax code, then you are continued to file your taxes. 
even though you reside outside of the US. So it's not a function of having a bank account or not. By virtue of having a passport or green card, you're still a US tax person, regardless of where you reside on planet Earth. So you still have responsibilities from a US tax perspective. If you do not have a passport, a green card, and you were in the US on a work permit, and you surrendered that and you properly handed that over, and you severed that um, situation, then you don't need to worry about U.S. taxes on your worldwide income, only U.S. taxes on your U.S. source income. So uh, you, you can keep your U.S. bank account. Uh, the interest on that bank account may be subject, depending on how much is in it, of course, may be subject to some withholding of taxes. But other than that, there should be no issues. Uh, Professor, you had a comment on an Israel from the Israel perspective. Yeah, it's not just a question. I wanted to, to, to give a, a to look at the bigger picture. Since you are more than four years outside in Israel, usually we regard it as a non-Israeli tax resident for all of these five years. So you don't have to report on your US income in the period where you've been in the US. Mm -hmm. However, since you came to Israel in less than six years outside of Israel you will not be regarded as a, a returning resident. I mean, you will not be entitled to any tax benefit other than not paying tax on the time being in the US. Um, as Darren said, if you have any income from this uh, bank account, interest, and uh, dividends, if you're holding uh, securities or something like that, you have to pay tax on it also in Israel. Uh, for example, if you have a capital gains, probably if you're not a US tax person, probably your US bank will exempt you from paying tax in the US, but then you have to pay tax on it in Israel. If you're just holding um, in your current account in the US and don't have any income, you actually don't have to report on it in Israel. If, if this is your only US connection, only non Israeli connection, and you are a, an employee, then maybe you don't even have to file uh, taxes in Israel at all. So you should check this point and maybe you don't have to file taxes in Israel at, uh, at all if you don't have any income from this bank account. Okay, great. I hope that answers your question. Moving down the list of questions here on Zoom. Okay, someone is saying that they joined the live stream late. That's okay. Uh, everything is gonna be recorded and it will be available on quite a number of platforms on our website, hg.tax. It'll be on uh, our Facebook group. It will be on YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Amazon, Apple iTunes, SoundCloud, Podbean. So probably like over 20 podcast uh, platforms. So basically wherever you get your preferred podcast, if you have a look for hg.tax, you will find this uh, recordings. So don't worry that you missed the beginning. You, you can catch up uh, on your preferred platform. Hope that helps. Okay. Next question. Okay. Forgive me for not pronouncing this properly. Someone started Bituach Lumi. And then they say Dash made Aliyah within 10 year period and then heading back to the US for a job there. Not clear how long. Should, okay, the person is not clear how long they're going to be moving to uh, back to the U.S. Is there any way not to pay the Bichuak Lumi? It's fairly sizable. I'm not sure I understand. So this person made Aliyah and then came back to the U.S. And now having income from the U.S. And asking whether I should pay Bichuak Lumi in Israel? This is the question? This is my understanding of the question. And if we... Uh, if we're not understanding you correctly, could you please correct us? But that's my understanding, yes. Okay, so so in order to understand the, the, the answer, you need to understand that in Israel, you have your status for the ITA, the income tax, and you have the status for the Tuch Lumi, meaning that you can be an Israeli as a resident for the Tuch Lumi, but not for income tax and the other way around. So if you are an Israeli, uh, a tax resident for Bituach Lumi, you probably should pay Bituach Lumi on your non-Israeli income. With a, 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 a some point that you need to understand that 
usually the way the Bituch Lumi works in Israel is that they are taking uh, your reporting to the income tax and get the information from there. But if you don't have to file any income tax in Israel because you left Israel, you came back to the US, probably they will just ask you to pay the minimal amount around 170 shekels. You have some exposure here that they will ask you to, to pay on your US income, but usually they're not doing so. And after five years outside of Israel, they will cancel your Israeli status with your Duch Lumi, and you will end up with just paying this 170 shekels a month, basically it. And you need to know that if your status with the Duch Lumi is canceled, and you can request to cancel it even before these five years, when you will go back to Israel, you will have to wait six years in Israel without going out, or to pay around 12,000 12,000 shekels before you can receive any medical uh, treatment free in Israel. Before you can go to what you call in Israel, Kupatholim, or in hospital without paying for that, uh, you will have to wait at least six months or pay 12,000 shekels. Uh, so it's not always smart to run and cancel your Betokum status because you need to understand that if, for example, you, you think that if uh, uh, something bad will happen to you, you jump on the first airplane, go to an Israeli hospital. If this is the circumstances, it's better and you don't have like a very good US medical uh, insurance, you probably want to save your Bitochumi status and to pay your Bitochumi. Hmm. Okay, I hope that, res that uh, answers your question. If not, please feel free to type in the box below. This is uh, for you guys on, on Facebook. So we are seeing your questions. Going back to Zoom, because I'm trying to respond to them in the order in which they have been submitted, right? So I have a teacher's pension in Israel and get Social Security. I was told that US Social Security would be lowered because of my pension. Is that true? from a US perspective, I'm unaware that your social security payments would be reduced because you are receiving from somewhere else, but we'd probably need to take a, a closer look at that to, to really understand the nuances of that. Professor, are you familiar with a situation like this? No, I'm actually yeah. not familiar. Yeah, so uh, I'm not familiar because your social security your, your social security benefit from a US perspective is a function of how much your contributions to your social security account, right? So I, I'm unaware that your benefit or your return, so the benefit of your contributions would be reduced because of you having a pension somewhere else in another country. So I, I, I don't believe that is the case. Uh, next question, also here on Zoom. How exactly are unqualified Israeli options taxed differently between the countries? And does the difference in taxing mean that I pay tax twice? In other words, will I need to pay both American and Israel Israeli taxes for unqualified options? Professor, I think you did touch on this already. Yes. Well, in Israel, we have uh, most of the employees receiving the option under Section 102 to the income tax ordinance. And the current position of the ITA is that you pay once you exercise. And uh, uh, then, correct me if I want, but the current uh, uh, opinion of the IRS is that you pay with respect to your vesting period. This means that if you are vesting in Israel and exercise in Israel, you will probably okay. If you're vesting in the US and also exercise in the US, you're probably okay. But if you vest, your option was vested in the time you made a relocation to the US, for example, and then you come to Israel and then you exercise, you have a, 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 a quite a problem here um, and can be a resulted in paying twice. You, you have to check with your consultant uh, the specific uh, way that it went. Uh, 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 sometimes we have solutions for that. Sometimes the solution is uh, to take a position. Sometimes the solution is to go to a ruling with the ITA. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, and it worked in the past in, in several occasions, but generally speaking, uh, if you invested in the US and exercise in Israel, we have a problem we have to, to take care of. Yeah, so just, just to add to that, we I haven't dealt with any client with uh, Israel treatment from a tax perspective of options, Israel versus the US, but I've dealt with uh, US versus Singapore, Holland versus Singapore, Holland versus the US. So it is it is something that comes up a lot. And, you know, just to, just to echo what was already said, planning, planning, planning. So sit with an advisory team as soon as possible and go through the details because with this stuff, the devil's in the detail. And, you know, you need to be proactive. So before you move or before you do anything, before you exercise, just sit with someone and go through the details. All right. Uh, okay, so, so the follow-up, the actual American tax must be played. Yes, so your professor is absolutely correct. The IRS looks at the vesting. So you, from a U.S. company, they'll give you a vesting schedule. Uh, that's pretty standard tax document. So you will get to see exactly what year something would vest, what period it vests in, and therefore when there'll be uh, a U.S. tax consequence as a result of that. So yes, it's driven by vesting. Okay. Uh, going back to Facebook. Okay. If I convert a 401k to a Roth, I pay ordinary, I pay ordinary taxes, capital gain income, then how later Roth distributions handled in Israel? Okay, so from a US tax perspective, uh, just, just to kind of create the context, uh, that basically I, I know I'm being really simplistic, but there are two categories of retirement plans from a US tax perspective. They're those in which you can invest pre-tax money. So you're reducing your taxable income, but on the end, the tail end, when the money gets distributed, it will be subject to taxes. So you, you pay tax and you pull it out. So there are those that you invest with pre-tax money and there are those that you invest with after-tax money. And of course, when you put in after-tax money, the, the upside on that is that whatever happens when you pull it out, it'll be tax-free, right? So the Roth, is the one with after-tax money. So you're gonna invest after-tax money in the Roth. And so this person is asking if they convert from a 401k, one with pre-tax money to a, a Roth, uh, what are the tax consequences? Well, from a US tax perspective, it is something that's commonly done that yeah, people regularly roll a traditional 401k into a Roth especially right now where most people are betting that we're in an environment where taxes are going to be going up, you know, in the short to medium term, maybe even in long term, we're in a rising tax environment because of uh, certain factors that are in place. So people are saying, you know what, I want to pay the taxes now rather than waiting further down the road and pay it when I have to pull stuff up. So yes, you can convert in and you can roll over into a Roth and you pay income taxes on the money in that year. So yes, you're absolutely correct. Uh, it's particularly, in our experience, we see it being particularly beneficial with the higher income earners who aren't normally permitted to invest into a Roth because of the phase outs. So no, you know, if you earn more than a certain amount, you, you, you can't technically put it into a Roth. So this is a, a backdoor, another way of getting it into a Roth. And right now, because of the rising tax environment, people are saying, hey, Roth is king, right? Okay, so that, that, that is from a, a US perspective. Uh, professor, from an Israeli perspective, assuming that this, this lady is, is Israeli exposed as well, what would be the tax consequences of withdrawing from a US, I guess, I guess from a, I'm just imagining it's like an early withdrawal and then putting it into another retirement vehicle in the US. Any comments? Withdrawing from Israel fund and investing in, in some kind of US fund, right? This is the question? Yes, yeah, so from one US retirement fund into another. 
but but they from a u.s perspective by pulling it out of this one particular fund which is the one with that you put in pre-tax money by taking it out and putting it into the other you have to pay income tax on it from a u.s perspective so, yeah it's quite complex but we have to understand if in, in usually in israel it will be regarded as a withdrawal we need to, to have to pay taxes on it also you have some exemption uh, on receiving uh, this type of income in if you uh, reach to the retirement age for example um, you may be i mean may be entitled for 35 percent exemption on, okay. on debt mm -hmm. uh, but on the rest you will probably have to pay uh, tax and you will get credit if you pay taxes in the US you'll get credit mm -hmm. on it so maybe you yeah. don't have to, to add anything else you could have the exemption and the credit but we have to to to, to check it specifically okay that, that's great so we're at the top of the hour so I'll just allow one last question sorry for those who ask other questions but you know time uh, time is time so this one last question a Roth distribution so Again, this is money that has already been taxed on the way in to this retirement fund. So let's assume someone is, I guess, the Israeli tax resident at that point, and they're getting a distribution, so withdrawal from the U.S. retirement fund, which has already been taxed, uh, taxed on the way in. Would it be taxed in Israel when they're pulling it out? Not sure I understood actually the question. I'm sorry. Right. No, that's okay. So remember, we're saying that there are two types, broadly speaking, two types of U.S. retirement funds. So there are those that you put in pre-tax money just to reduce your taxable income, and there are those that we put in after-tax money, so money that's already been taxed. And the the Roth is the one where you put in after-tax money. So um, so you put in after tax money and from a US perspective, when you pull it out, the money has already been taxed and you're allowed to pull it out once you retire at whatever age. And the gains, because it would have been invested in the fund. So the original investment plus the gains can be pulled out tax-free from a US perspective. So uh, she- Israel, is, in, Yeah. In, uh, now I think I understand, but in Israel, if you can show that you uh, the type of the first investment, this of course will not be taxed again. I mean, this is right. something that you will pay tax on, but all the incomes yeah. after that, you will have to pay tax in Israel. Right. Okay. I thought so. This is something we have to do in other jurisdictions like, you know, Spain, Portugal. Yeah. So we, so in other words, we have to bifurcate the, 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 the money that's being pulled out. And to say how much of the your distribution at whatever particular point in time is your original investment and how much is the return on the investment. So the return will be taxable by Israel. The original investment that you put in, which has already been taxed, would not. Okay. Makes a lot of sense. I hope that answers your question on, on Facebook. So We've come to you know the, the end of another exciting session. Uh, we do this every week, and we'll be doing another one with the professor in the new year. So thank you for joining. Again, you can. Thank you very uh, much. It's always a pleasure. Thank you very much, everyone, for us today. Yeah, and feel free to, uh, if you if you rewind this presentation uh, back to the slides. You can, you, the professor's contact details were there if you want to reach out to him directly. So thank you for joining. See you next time. Bye, Bye guys. Uh, from the Jewish community, happy Hanukkah. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Here are four ways we can help you. Number one, sign up for free webinars on U.S. expat taxes and international entrepreneur taxes at www.htj.tax. Number two, stream premium educational videos at www.hcj.tax Number 3. Contact us for tax optimization consult over Zoom. Number 4. High net worth. We can quote for doing your U.S. international taxes returns. Our books and upcoming events are available at htj.tax 
please subscribe, like, share, and comment below. Email us at help at htj.txt to engage us to advise on international tax or business matters.